Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today on the show, we're joined by Andrew Hinkes, author and professor from New York University, focusing on the intersection of law, crypto regulation, and digital assets. We talk about the OFAC sanctioning of the Ethereum Mixer Tornado Cash, what it means for Bitcoin miners, and what it further means for the industry itself. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. As a premier training and education program for professional mining technicians, Foundry Academy answers. From hands-on ASIC labs taught by industry veteran instructors to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact, Foundry Academy graduates acquire the skills facilities need to be off and mining. They've even built OSHA 10 certification into the curriculum. Open to all who hold a high school degree or equivalent, the next one week course taking place in Rochester, New York, runs September 12th through the 17th. Visit foundryacademy.com to register or reach out to academy at foundrydigital.com. Drew, welcome to the Compass Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. It's cool to have you on. I've seen some of your stuff in the past, including uh, some of the things you've written for Coindesk about OFAC sanctioning. And that's why I wanted to have you on as an expert in the field and someone who predicted a lot of things that we saw this week with Tornado Cash and its impact potentially for Bitcoin miners and the Bitcoin network. Thanks so much for having me. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, sometimes it's good to be able to, to anticipate things coming. Uh, but I didn't quite see this one coming. Yeah, it's definitely a crazy one because it's on the smart contract level, right? Which I don't think a lot of people anticipated something like that happening. OFAC has blacklisted some addresses in the past, especially some Bitcoin ones you cannot interact with. And to correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that it's a lot of things to do with terrorism. So like Hamas assets or uh, addresses that they use for garnering Bitcoin funds or other terrorist networks out there. I've not seen anything on the smart contract level. It's a huge change to put it a government sanction on an application, specifically one that's an uncensorable application that can continue to live on itself. And this leads to a lot of questions about Bitcoin mining. But before we dive into that, just to get a quick intro from yourself and what your interest is in this space. I mean, you've been writing about this sort of thing possibly happening uh, years back. And, you know, We have stuff from you from 2017, 2018 about it. That's right. Um, I, I've been, uh, I guess I'm a Bitcoin class of 2013, started trying to figure out how to make a living as a lawyer who really likes Bitcoin in 2014. Um, and fast forward now, I'm an adjunct professor and teach at NYU, I'm a partner at k Gates where my practice covers crypto, um, and try to understand how the eccentricities of digital assets um, would interact with regulation has always been to me the most interesting part of what a lawyer can do to help companies and clients and customers in this area. Um, I like digital assets. I like the freedom that we get when we use them. And I think that the interaction between existing law and how law will develop around these new decentralized um, systems and products is really what's the most interesting part of this industry for me. Um, We have understood that these assets can be used by anyone, good, bad, or otherwise. And OFAC, which is the Office of Foreign Asset Controls, Um, is primarily a national security-related organization. It cares about crime. It cares about crime that implicates national security, which means um, international ransomware, child exploitation rings, um, financing of enemy states, and so forth are things that you're going to find in the OFAX block list, which is called the SDN, or Specially Designated Nationals. Um, It has been altered by a couple of different laws to include things like drug kingpins. Um, There's the, uh, the incredibly entertainingly named Kingpin Act, which allows uh, the U.S. government to designate drug dealers on the SDN list. And we saw that actually happen uh, for a Chinese fentanyl ring where their crypto asset addresses were added onto the SDN list. Um, You'll also see enemy nations like or or nations with whom we don't have good relations like North Korea. And you'll also see uh, organizations like Hamas or other terrorist organizations. The goal of putting someone or something on the SDN list is to make sure that U.S. persons do not transact with them, and to make sure that their assets are blocked from U.S. transactions. This makes a lot of sense when you're dealing with a person or with a business entity, but it gets weird when you're talking about a piece of functionally autonomous code, because there isn't a person. Uh, For Tornado Cash specifically, they do have a governance token that gives the token holders some limited control over certain functionality of the platform, but I think it would be a stretch to say that the token holders control or own or necessarily are operating Tornado Cash for their benefit. 
So this is uh, something of a new development, and it brings up all kinds of really interesting questions. Yeah, definitely. This is an interesting one. If I can pull the spotlight to myself for a second, I reported about Tornado Cash launching back in 2020. It was one of my favorite articles that year just because it was such an interesting project when it went live. This was like middle of DeFi summer where a bunch of new applications were launching on top of Ethereum. A lot of people are excited about like the potential for returning to utility for Ethereum after everything that had been going on with the ICO era. And Tornado Cash was a huge project because it essentially allowed any user to have more privacy and more fungibility with their Ether tokens than previously. And so even Vitalik was a big proponent of this project. And I think a lot of people in the Monero space or who are really into Bitcoin privacy were also pretty happy with this project because it brought a lot of basic fundamental security and privacy to Ethereum token holders. Just for listeners who are not familiar with Tornado Cash, what it essentially does is it allows you to break the transaction history between Ether you hold and Ether you hold in the future. You put some Ether into this application and then you pull some Ether out of it, but it's not going to be the same Ether. It'll be the same amount, but it'll be a different piece of Ether. That's because a lot of people are dropping Ether basically into this bag and you're pulling it out. It's like dumping a bunch of marbles into a bag and everyone has a different marble when they pull it back out, uh, but you get the same size marble. It's a very useful piece of tech and we see it with other applications too, like Bitcoin as well. So there's like Samurai Wallet and Wasabi and things like that, which have similar methods, not really worth going to for, for this conversation. Um, it's a, probably a more techie conversation than we're going to have. But there's similar things that I think Bitcoiners are also going to be worried about coming out of this, which leads me to my next question for you, Drew. The things you're writing about in 2017, 2018 were slightly different, right? It wasn't going to be a sanction on a DAP per se. It's more about OFAC putting out a list of addresses and asking the base layer and asking miners or asking others to not interact with those addresses specifically. Can you tell me a little bit why you didn't see something happening on the application layer? Because now with hindsight and looking a week back, I'd say like the application layer is since it's up the stack a little bit more, it's probably a little bit more vulnerable to government regulations than the base layer, but maybe that's not true. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. Um, and I think the primary to, to directly answer your question, the primary reason I was more focused on a person's wallet or a company's wallet rather than a wallet that provides services based on code that isn't operated by a person, uh, whether it's a legal person or a legal entity, is because the SDN list exists to sanction legal entities and their property. Um, this is, to my knowledge, something new, something that has never been done with the SDN list previously. Um, you haven't, for instance, seen sanctions against a word processing program or a spreadsheet in the past. It's been people, their assets based on their activity, which led to them being classified in certain ways. The pretense or the explanation as to why this occurred, uh, which it was communicated in a few different ways, was that the law enforcement and intelligence community understood that the Tornado Cash tool was being used frequently by the Lazarus Group, which is uh, associated with criminal activity uh, enriching the uh, DPRK, which is absolutely on the SDN list. The implications of adding a, a software tool that is not owned by any person, um, which would then collaterally have the result of affecting the property that flows through it is something that's new. Um, I just simply did not anticipate that the SDN list would be expanded from people and their property to non-people. Interesting. I w I'd like to go back to your to your uh, point earlier that you disagree with like the where the sanctioning enforcement would occur. Uh, because from my perspective, I'm looking at the base layer of Bitcoin. And if we're thinking of it in terms of users and operators. You could say users is anyone who holds Bitcoin, maybe nodes, but they kind of could go either way. But the operators, pretty strongly, you could say, be miners in addition to probably exchanges and, and other services. But miners are the ones moving Bitcoin on behalf of others, especially in the regulatory eyes. Probably I'll get some flack from people who somewhat disagree with that. But from a regulator's perspective, that's a common way of seeing it say that yeah, I don't necessarily think a miner is necessarily a money transmitter simply because it runs a hashing function. I think that plenty of miners 
may also engage in the type of conduct that results in them being classified as money transmitters. Um, but from a, a from a, a functional standpoint, yes, they confirm transactions with the result that value flows from a wallet to a wallet, and they do, if they are fortunate enough to find a block, receive some form of compensation in the form of the tip. But I, I, from a regulatory standpoint, I, I'm not familiar with the idea that just because you are mining, you are a money transmitter. Yeah, so that, that was definitely like a point of question last summer, right? When we saw some conversations on Capitol Hill about what is the point of a miner and that went into that, um, what was that bill? I can't remember off the top of my head, but there was the bill that they were talking on Capitol Hill about um, mining and how it would be included in this or not included in this. And that, to my understanding, never went through. But from the regulatory the, conversation... You're talking about the tax bill? Are you talking yeah, about that the tax, tax bill. bill? That's what it was. The, so the yeah. tax bill did go through and it did it could hypothetically be read so that miners would be considered to be uh, brokers for taxation purposes. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, that didn't go all the way to say that a broker would be considered that a miner would be considered a broker for, and then have to be registered as a broker or anything like that. That would also be particularly problematic. Yeah, no, definitely against that as a miner myself. Uh, Just to get back to, to the point of contention or maybe just like the point of conversation here to me, when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at mining pools. I'm looking at how they have the ability to select transactions. I'm looking about how they have a physical footprint somewhere. I know these people who are running mining pools, right? And that's the place that they could be, that the regulators could come after very easily. And that's what most mining pools are somewhat expecting. That It's not uncommon to go to a Bitcoin conference and go to a mining conversation. And that's one of the conversations a lot their way is like, what are you going to do when OFAC does something like this? From your perspective, does what happened with Tornado Cash sort of move that conversation forward and it's more possible this happens in the next few years? Or do you consider this to somewhat be a, a moot point because regulators are not seeing miners as operators and movers of transactions? Well, this is certainly concerning because it shows that OFAC is expanding its its view of what it can regulate and what it can govern with the SDN list. I don't believe that just because they do this, we should expect that every other smart contract is going to be sanctioned and that miners are going to be sanctioned. I think that it is a risk and that it's out there, but I don't get the sense that because this happened, we should expect miners to be sanctioned. Um, and and I, can, I can elaborate a little bit on why from the perspective of um, if I'm a law enforcement agent, I can do two things. I can keep my eye on where I think crime is happening to determine whether the crime is happening, collect information and use it. Or I can simply say, I think crime is happening here and shut my eyes to it altogether. Um, My sense is that there's a lot of value in insight and visibility. And that if there was to be some sort of law or designation, like we saw for Tornado Cash that says anybody who's a crypto miner cannot uh, transact among these addresses, I think that there would be a, a considerable lack of visibility into transactions. And that would probably actually be damaging for law enforcement. That would probably be uh, against the interests of the national security apparatus that wants to collect intelligence about bad actors, that wants to understand how these tools are being used, because how else can they combat the crime? Simply not allowing US persons to do something doesn't mean the problem goes away. Well, that's an interesting take and not one I expected, but it does make sense from a, from the way that you laid out the logic there. And that leads me to a question about Marathon Pool, which also did basically elected to choose to follow OFAC sanctions last summer, right? Where they're like, hey, we're not going to interact with these addresses. They're known OFAC sanctioned addresses. Any transaction that comes through here and we win a block, we're not going to allow that transaction into our pool. And there's been a few other pools that have actually built that into their software specifically, and they market it as like a reason to use their pool. But there's been no guidance or pressure unless it's behind closed doors to do this to date, to my understanding. But yet people, there's an interest. There is an interest in people using software like that. How do you square that? Is that just a marketing tool for a lot of these big miners? Or is it something that they're looking forward and have different guidance than you would have? I wish I knew what the government was going to do next. It would be incredibly (laughs) helpful if I knew what the next move was going to be. Um, So understanding that this is all reading tea leaves. 
when a regulator, particularly somebody like OFAC, does something new and novel, a lot of times there are unexpected consequences. Uh, a lot of times you'll see that there is an action taken or a, a designation made, and then shortly thereafter, there will be frequently asked questions that are issued by the agency that will explain how it's to be implemented or will elaborate on how um, a, a person can comply. The hope for the tornado cash designation is that we'll see some FAQs that come shortly that elaborate on issues like, if I received something from tornado cash without knowing it, what do I have to do? Um, how long does the taint associated with an asset that came from tornado cash stay? Um, the compliance that you generally have to engage in if you receive property from a sanctioned actor is that you have to segregate it. If it's fiat, you put it in an interest bearing account, you report to the government, and you continue to do annual reports about it unless the government gives you a license to dispose of it in accordance with the way that the government will explain to you that you can dispose of it. Um, and so there are obviously a lot of issues for crypto assets. Uh, I don't know of a government approved interest bearing account for me to put my ETH in, for instance. So there are a lot of technical compliance issues that are out there that would that are sort of begging for an explanation. Whether we'll see something in an FAQ that says, we don't read this to suggest that everybody in the entire industry needs to now be blocking this um, is unlikely. But what I would suggest is that this is everyone who mines, everyone who operates a business in crypto should have general awareness of sanctions laws, especially if they're US focused, US based, serve US persons. Um, they should have a sanctions compliance program. Whether if they're a money transmitter, they have to have you know the the the, whole, the full shebang. They have to have BSA and all the rest. And even if they're not, they should have some sort of sanctions compliance program. They should be monitoring to make sure that they're not actively involved in any money laundering. And um, the SDN list certainly is an important part of it. If you are not regulated as a money transmitter, you then have a, a different set of choices that you can make, and it's a risk based assessment that ultimately everyone is going to enter into. Now, I say it's a risk-based assessment, but we have to understand that the risks are significant. If you violate OFAC sanctions, um, it's basically strict liability. There is no defense. You have violated. What the government will look at then is to determine whether you had procedural safeguards in place, policies, and whether you were following those policies to prevent something like this from happening. No one is perfect. Accidents happen. Um, but we've seen in other instances that violations of OFAC, I think we saw one against BitGo not long ago. Um, are, are severe. So while it would not begrudge me if I heard that a miner was trying to take action uh, to comply with the OFAC designations, um, I think that it's something that each miner is going to want to talk to their counsel about, try to understand their level of risk. We don't have any clarity from a regulatory perspective whether a miner that is using specialized equipment to run a hashing algorithm um, is actually considered to be um, regulated in such a way. I think that uh, the the situation you described with that one miner may have been a more conservative position than others in the industry have taken. Um, but my sense is that it's been on the it's been an area of interest for regulators for quite a while, and it wouldn't surprise me if you heard more. Yeah, part of me wonders if it was like a marketing ploy or at least like a, a marketing stick to get more people to use their software or uh, just the more conservative people out there, conservative miners out there, more corporate types are thinking like this is a good software to use. And like you just suggested, everyone should have some sort of policy in place because at the very end of the day, you are operating a business that uses money and is somewhat moving money as well. I want to move over the conversation to something that's actually in an article back from 2018, you wrote in Coindesk talking about the consequences for OFAC uh, sanctioning addresses or sanctioning coins or moving into the industry in general. OFAC choosing to start sanctioning projects. Uh, there could be a litany of problems associated with this that a lot of uh, cryptocurrency users, operators, exchanges, etc. are not super familiar with. Uh, the one that first comes to mind is Bitcoin itself. The asset would have some sort of gradation on it where there'd be virgin coins that have not touched an address that is sanctioned and then there'd be some that be sort of in the gray zone that have like 
been associated with an address at a certain point in time. And then there's just going to be some Bitcoin that you do not want to touch and would probably trade with a discount or not being tradable at all. Uh, be curious if you could lay that out for us. And then also after that, we'll talk about the tainted coins and uh, what we saw with Tornado Cash this week when they were sort of spread out all over to all these celebrities. So I always laugh at the idea of tainted coins because that's an artificial construct. Um, but yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Suppose hypothetically that there was some sort of law that said Bitcoins that pass through a certain address are no longer um, usable by US persons. Hypothetically, you could enter a situation where there are different types of Bitcoin that are available on the market, some of which have taint on them and some of which do not have taint on them. Bitcoin is different than Ethereum in that Bitcoin is UTXO based as opposed to balance based, which means that from a transactional standpoint, you can actually identify increments of Bitcoin as they are used in transactions. And so hypothetically, you could identify a transaction, identify the increment of Bitcoin that is controlled by a public key address, and you could hypothetically segregate that from others, which would result in, I have half a Bitcoin in my wallet, hypothetically, that is tainted. I'm going to segregate that and report on that, no problem. And the other 10 million Bitcoin that I have are totally kosher and I can use them for whatever I want. However, if I don't know about this, engage in a whole bunch of transactions, and I find that my UTXO in the process of spending have been commingled or joined and created a new UTXO, which incorporates in whole or in part some of the prior UTXO, which has the taint on it, then we get into this, this crazy idea that we need to then appraise our UTXOs based upon how much of a given UTXO we expect is tainted, and then assign a value based upon its hypothetical transactability to parties that are going to be compliant with regulation. And this gets us back to the old days when we had state banks that issued dollars, and a US dollar from this state was actually worth less than a US dollar on that state or when we had coins that were specie currency where they were actually made of metals and where you had to weigh the coin because it might look like the same coin, but if somebody had clipped the edge, it might weigh less. And thus my $1 coin is actually worth 94 cents because somebody 10 transactions ago clipped the edge. Um, I find this to be unlikely. I think that it is a very bad scenario for crypto and I I, I don't see it happening for the simple reason that uh, in part, OFAC doesn't work that way. Um, and the consequence of having an address sanctioned would not necessarily call for this. Um, and secondarily, I don't think that the industry wants to see Bitcoin become that much less fungible. Um, the proceeds of a transaction that went through a listed financial institution account, or in this case, smart contract, prior to the smart contract being listed, doesn't really matter. Once you receive it, it's your property. And the fact that the asset address, or, or sorry, the, the entity that is sanctioned or the address from where it come got, uh, comes got listed later, not really your problem, somebody else's problem. If you are receiving a transaction um, and you do not find out about it, there's no compliance in place, and then you seek to use it with another entity that is screening, um, it's going to really be a question of that entity's screening procedures. They might decide that they will not interact with assets that came directly from a sanctioned address, but perhaps three hops away is okay, um, or, or 10 hops away. It's not entirely clear. This would be a great thing for the FAQ to cover uh, because there just isn't really a great answer here. Um, it's sort of analogous to the idea that you can be a renter in a home, and then the person who owned that, owns that home uh, is all of a sudden listed. Are you no longer allowed to rent there? Kind of seems a little bit uh, in a posit. Um, but there, I've always heard that there is this mythological market for virgin coins that have never been transacted. Um, I still have yet to find the exchange that offers me you know, VBTC. Haven't found it yet. I keep looking. Um, There's a lot of miners out there who that's their, their shtick for home mining or whatnot. It's like, get some virgin Bitcoins. There's no transaction history. And there's other arguments for that, obviously, as well. One point of clarification or just a personal edification for myself is the accounts-based model for Ethereum and those coins and the UTXO model. The UTXO model you just laid out. But for the accounts model, I've seen that this can be... This OFAC sanctions or anything associated with it 
could be a knock against accounts based models just because it's so much more linear to understand where coin has been in the past. I mean, I've already seen this personally. I went to a crypto um, merchant company back in like 2019 and they were monitoring every sort of tether that was coming through their account. And they had very simple software that'd be like, this is a red tether. Don't use it. It's interacted with these wallets in the past. This is a green tether. It's only been used on these accounts. So it's safe to use. Is there a significant change uh, between these two accounts that would lead you to believe that like a government regulator at some point in the future would be able to hammer down on one model versus the other? Or is this essentially superfluous? Well, it, it creates one issue. Um, and thank you for bringing me back to the UTXO versus balanced question. We did talk about UTXOs. From a, a balance-based standpoint, you have a different set of concerns. Because if I have a, a bit, an Ethereum wallet and I receive a transaction of five new ETH, um, I can't identify which of my ETH are those five. And so you sort of get this automatic commingling problem. And it's not entirely clear whether the entire the entirety of my ETH is now ruined and tainted, or whether I can decide that any five that I send to some other wallet is sufficient for compliance with my obligation to um, to segregate those ETH and hold them and not transact in them because they came from a sanctioned address. Another thing that would be great to have in the uh, FAQ that we hope will follow. We're all waiting for more government regulation uh, notices, like IRS taxation to the SEC to what <sighs> back. It looks like that's a common thread I'm, I'm pulling out of this conversation. <laughs> well, it's interesting because we get we get laws, we get interpretations of laws, we get um, tweaks on laws, and in some cases they are excellent. In other cases, they are not excellent. Uh, but in almost every case, because crypto assets are open, because the community that builds on top of open source software is so creative, um, you can find that there is almost no rule that is generally applicable across everything that can be built on a blockchain. And the result is that we need interpretation, we need clarification, and we're going to need iteration over time on almost all of these laws. Or we're going to need somebody to draw some lines and say, if you are creating this sort of system or this kind of asset, here are the set of regs that you need to comply with. Uh, I mean, you said the magic words, the SEC. I could go on for days about how the SEC's lack of law and lack of concrete binding guidance has made it nightmarish for those who want to issue instruments in the United States to function and has made it incredibly difficult for legal advisors like me who want to help people comply with the law to understand what their obligations are. Well, let's move the conversation over to a prediction of yours that came true, and that is these tainted coins being from Tornado Cash being shot out to almost you know a half dozen plus celebrities that had their wall addresses public. So this happened on Monday, I believe, or Tuesday. Maybe it was the day after, where an anonymous Twitter account said that they were going to start messing around with public ETH addresses. So Puma, the shoe company, got some tainted ETH. I believe Brian Armstrong and Coinbase got some tainted ETH. Jimmy Fallon got some tainted ETH. And they started spraying it everywhere. Uh, probably actually a bunch more accounts than a half dozen. I'm not sure what the, the total was. But this is something you predicted could occur back in 2018 that would make basically this point about tainted coins almost worthless, right? Because you know the ability to send a coin somewhere, it's, it's simple. Like I can point a coin at any address and send it there and they can't do anything to stop it. But it'd be great to get a recap on what happened and then how you predicted it and what you think the consequences are for it. Sure. So in, in 2018, when OFAC first started listing crypto asset addresses, I, I knew that this was important, but I obviously, you know, no one can cover everything. So I called a very smart compliance professional named Joe Ciccolo from BitAML. And he and I spent some time looking over this and thinking about what it meant and, and how it could go wrong. And, and one scenario that we envisioned was what we called a spray attack. The idea being that someone who controlled the sanctioned wallet, if they wanted to be a real you-know-what, could just start sending microtransactions. Um, and because most crypto asset wallets do not require you to do anything to accept a transaction, you would end up with this result that all kinds of people, by no fault of their own, are now holding sanctioned property in their digital asset wallets. They might not even know about it for a period of time. This could potentially create lots of liability for these parties. It could potentially create a burdensome reporting obligation. Um, all the things that we're concerned about happening now, we sort of suggested were a risk back then. 
Um, so if you were dusted with something, what would that mean? Well, it could trigger a reporting obligation. Uh, as I said before, the reporting guidance that's out there is helpful, but not necessarily um, doesn't necessarily give you all the information you need. And we hope that OFAC gives us more. Um, but big picture, what does it mean for somebody to start willy-nilly sending around tainted or, or barred assets? On one hand, it could make the entire exercise futile. If the entire chain has tainted assets, then what are we really accomplishing here? On the other hand, it could just be a massive pain in the you know what for everybody involved and prompt OFAC to give further clarification about under what circumstances you need to report. In the absence of any clarity, I would take the position that if you've received property from a blocked address or account, whether it's somebody gave you the keys to their Lambo and they are on the list, whether you, re you received a, a wire transfer from somebody's account and their bank account was on the list, which actually wouldn't happen, and I'll tell you why in a second, or whether you received dust, you probably have a reporting obligation. Circling back on the other point that I just said before, you don't necessarily have a spray problem in other contexts. Although there are things like seafaring vessels and airplanes that show up on the SDN list, it's actually kind of hard to transact a boat or an airplane. <clears throat> it's a lot harder to transact a boat or an airplane than it is crypto. And it's a lot hard to send a wire from a bank to a bank because banks all participate and they all have policies. <coughs> So it's unlikely that a bank is going to send a wire to a bank that will receive a wire from a blocked account. It's only in crypto that there's essentially no compliance on the receiving side. You don't even need to agree to accept a transfer. And so this is something of a unique problem. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Um, boats and planes are not very fungible and somewhat portable, depending on the context. But that makes sense from a, from a larger perspective. I'm wondering where this goes from here. And again, asking you to read the tea leaves since you're probably the, the best person who's going to be able to do that uh, unless you're working there itself. But where does OFAC go from here in terms of interpreting things? Is it going to be more stringent? Uh, what, what does this mean for things like privacy coins? What does this mean for miners? Like, I, I think a lot of people saw this news on Monday and were frankly pretty freaked out. And I think for good reason, right? Like you said a few times already, this was unprecedented and nobody expected a smart contract to be hit this hard. We're, we're already seeing other projects like MakerDAO trying to take like some very quick executive actions on top of what happened. Uh, but for, for those in the ecosystem that are taking a look at their own projects, how should they uh, go about next steps? And what do you think are some of the long tail consequences from this? Well, OFAC is certainly getting a lot of bang for their buck. It is a huge news item in the industry. Everyone is trying to figure out what it means. DeFi protocols are trying to figure out what to do. Uh, govern, uh, governed protocols, their governance proposals are flying around trying to figure out how to handle it. Um, it's significant because it shows that there is an entity out there that if they wanted to, and the government could create regulation that would drastically change the ability of parties to transact with each other. Big news, big, big change. Um, I think that, slash I hope, we will see FAQ from OFAC that explains some of the unanswered questions. But I think the big picture here is OFAC has shown that it can affect access to smart contracts in a way that technologically does not exist. They can create strict liability-based liability for users of technology, which is new. There are some questions as to whether OFAC has the statutory power to do this, whether the laws actually permit this. Um, there's some questions about who has standing to challenge this. Um, I know that Tornado Cash is governed by uh, holders of the TORN instrument. I don't know whether they actually have sufficient standing or not. Uh, there's this legal concept called standing, which means you've suffered a suitable injury that you can ask somebody for relief. Um, someone whose property was affected could probably um, seek to have an appeal of the designation. They would probably want to use the procedure by which they can ask for a license to use the property, notwithstanding the fact that it came from a blocked account. Um, this is expensive and time consuming. They're going to have to hire lawyers. Um, and they would probably need to wait until their license is denied to then bring an action uh, in court 
to appeal why the designation occurred. Um, there are some pretty considerable First Amendment questions at issue here. Um, we've seen from the Bernstein case that um, code is free speech. Now, just because it's free speech doesn't mean that you can say anything, right? What it means is that you cannot be prevented from speaking by a prior restraint imposed by the government. So perfect example, I can say that the president is an idiot, or I can say that the vice president is the smartest person in the world, and nobody from the government can stop me. But if I go to someone hypothetically and offer them money to kill somebody for me, that was speech, but that speech is also a crime. So, you know, free speech is one of these things that we as Americans love and most Americans don't really understand, which is okay. Um, but that we do have speech rights related to the use of technology. Um, we do have a bunch of different law out there, including law from FinCEN, which is the regulator that regulates um, money transmission that talks about requirements to comply with the BSA um, for, for writers of software, which would appear to sort of collide with this in, in an oblique way. Um, there are a lot of questions about where this goes to, to beat the drum to death here. I hope that there are FAQ that come out soon that clarify all of this because there are a lot of questions in the industry. Um, but if OFAC wanted to get everyone's attention, they certainly have. Um, I think that OFAC is probably considering now whether blocking a utility because it's being used by bad actors is the best way to handle the bad actors. Last question for you. Privacy coins, anything like that? Do you expect further development in that world because of this? Do you expect maybe some changes to Bitcoin pools, like things like PayNIMS, where you're able to send out to different addresses? My expectation is to see a proliferation of development on privacy coming out of this ruling, or at least I hope there is. Obviously, privacy is never the sexy topic, and it's the last thing to, to be thought of when people are building most projects. But I'd be curious to get your take if there's going to be any action from industry, any conversations you're having with teams that you know of that are already moving forward with this. Well, I hope that any team out there that's working on privacy-enabled technology continues to do so. It's critical. Um, we have an erosion of privacy in this country. Um, Justice Brandeis gave us a right to privacy. We see it being attacked in courts. We see it being attacked through regulation. Crypto is tremendously important for privacy. I gave an 18-minute TED-style talk at a conference about two years ago about why we need to continue to use crypto transactionally to protect our Fourth Amendment rights. I'm a huge proponent of privacy for Americans. We have all these rights and we cannot simply give them away or allow them to be eroded. Um, does this suggest that folks that are using privacy-enabled transaction technology may be under additional scrutiny? Absolutely. The whole point of why OFAC designated these addresses was the, assu the assumption or evidence or correlation with transactions uh, that, according to the government, uh, were coming from DPRK and the Lazarus Group. And so if they are focusing on technology that can be used by everybody, both the good and the bad, then anyone who offers that kind of technology should be paying very close attention to all of this. Awesome. Drew, that's a great place to leave the conversation. Thank you so much. Where can, where can people find yourself, your writing, or any of your other work? Well, uh, you, I would love it if you'd follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Propel Forward. Um, I publish here and there um, on various news sources like Coindesk, as well as my own medium. Um, I've got a, a textbook, which for those who are academically inclined, uh, covers a lot of the regulatory issues around digital assets from a U.S. standpoint. Um, and hopefully I get to come on a really fun podcast again and talk about the next issue of the day. There we go. There we go. Always have a place here. Drew, thank you again so much for your time. Appreciative. Awesome.